Welcome to Fear Talk number 22. I'm Dr. R. Michael Fisher, and I have a guest today, Mark Satin, who I'll introduce in a moment. He'll introduce himself. Um, just to say a word about Fear Talks as a series and why I got into it, um, and I think Mark will probably relate to this, is that I found it really hard over the years to join groups of all kinds. And I've been in many activist groups. Mark is a long time, 60 year plus activist himself. We'll get into that uh, as the time goes. Yes, he sighs, I hear him 60 sigh. Counting, yes. And um, one of the things that I found um, over the years was the various groups I would get into, if I did try to get into sometimes what I call deeper issues and the issue around how fear influences us, fears influences others, how it influences and embeds in the culture itself, in politics, in society, and in history of civilization, and so on, that I found fear was not a popular topic. So surprising. Um, topics like peace, nonviolence, ecological justice, social justice, these were much more popular. And so yes. I found it hard to have a good conversation, a deep conversation on fear. So I started this fear talk series about four years ago, and I'm just continuing to find really interesting people to talk to about this topic fear. And of course, we can spin off in all kinds of directions. Mark's got a brand new book out, which I want to share with my audience as well. So I'm just going to say share very briefly, and I've asked um, you to prepare a quote, Mark, but I'm going to actually share briefly for my audience and for you, because you know nothing about me virtually, <laughs> only what you may have read on the internet. Is that correct? Uh, no, I, I've uh, I've checked out some of your books. I mean, I've looked at them. I, I haven't been able to read for 10 years. Yeah. As you know, I, I have uh, a terrible diabetic retinopathy, um, a product, by the way, of my, uh, my self-sacrificing activist diet for uh, for many many decades no this doubt. is one of the morals of my book what uh, what what anger uh which i think you would call fear <clears throat> what a what a overwhelming sense of needing to do needing to change the world immediately without caring over much about your personal needs um this is what happens to you over a long period of time the, dia the, uh, the, the diabetes turned into retinopathy, so I have not been able to read a book for 10 years, unfortunately. Right. But, uh, but I'll, I'll struggle with my quotes as best I can. I actually uh, blew them up into 22-point uh, type. Okay, so I can, great. I can do that. But I have not been able, as I say, to read your books, but I'm very familiar of your importance as a fearologist, you. your pioneering work. And, and so it gives me great pleasure and uh, a, a um, sense of pride to be on my very first podcast with you. Thank you, Mark. So back in 1980, I was in Alberta, Canada. Mark, right now, I think you're living in Oakland, correct? Yes, I do. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, yeah, in Alberta, and so I'm in the prairies here. This is a very conservative part of the world, 1980s. I'd just become a teacher. Uh, I joined this small sort of conscious community that was in this small rural town mm. in mid-Alberta, Bible Belt, mm. Alberta. But there was an interesting group, 1980s, right? Marion, Marilyn Ferguson's Aquarian Conspiracy just got published. Brain Mind Bulletin was being published. And some of yes. us in Canada... We're getting that literature and one person in our community actually did and then about a year or two later all of a sudden the book by mark satin shows up you know i just show the picture of the cover new age politics yay okay. let me correct you it showed up a year two years before marilyn's book was published right on exactly. hers may have reached you before yeah but this one this was this was the first uh the first of a long line of, of new age transformational books, I'm happy to say. No kidding. And yes. I was, of course, very politically green, even though I'd been in the rock and roll, you know, stardom since I was 14. By 1980, wow. I had never really dove into politics. And in Canada, of course, you just don't get the same opportunities that was happening along the West Coast of America, et cetera. Right. 
And anyways, right. this book sold for two ninety five. I just see right down in the corner here, and that tells you about the times. Uh, it tells you about me. I insisted you. to my publisher. I insisted to my publisher that if he wanted to publish the book, it had to be. Um, he was going to charge four ninety five. I told him charge two ninety five, print ten thousand copies, and he doesn't have to give me a cent. Wow. So, of course, um, oh, and he got all the royalties. So after Dell published it in the in the United States and it sold many, many tens of thousands of copies, I never saw a cent from the book. However, um, it did reach many people at that price. And uh, that gave me great, great pleasure. I think that tells I, me something about your ethical commitment. Uh, to. I'm not sure it was ethical. <laughs> I, I think it, it is. Uh, it was dog-headed, I would say. Uh, dog-headed, <laughs> yes, but I think everything I've uh, read about your books and over the while read about people who've read it, you know, read your work and commented. Mm. But the one of the things they do say is that you're honest and you're upfront for the most part and you <laughs> you, you live what you you preach. This this indeed is true. It's all it's all true. Yes. Um, inadvertently, I mean, I, it's not up to me that I make thirteen thousand dollars a year at this at this stage of my life. But yeah. but uh, I I ran mostly small nonprofit groups for most of my life, and and uh, of course, um, rather than um, taking large salaries, um, I would put everything into promotion and. Uh, this is this is what happens after 60 years. I'm not complaining. I'm just warning other people against this lifestyle. And part of the purpose of my book is to warn people that what seems like righteous anger, first of all, is often true anger directed at the wrong objects, one's parents, um, the world in general. Um, I have to I have to tell you, Michael, that this um this session is coming three days after I learned that a very dear old girlfriend of mine, who's actually mentioned in my book, I can't give her name because her family and her friends do not want me to mention it, but she was even worse than me, so self-sacrificing that, for example, and, and, and so politically pure that she was chosen over 200 people um, when I was uh, with her to to work as a military analyst. She'd been a, over 200 people, including Ivy League grads, which she was not, to do that sort of work. And after a couple of weeks, she decided to quit because she just couldn't deal with military stuff. But I think, as you would point out, um, a lot of it was fear, Michael. She just didn't want to confront the ugliness of the world. And she ended up doing wonderful work, mm -hmm. but not at, at that level of importance. And had she done, we were in Washington DC at the time, had she done that for two years with this guy, a well-known military analyst, um, she'd have been sent to Harvard or um, the Woodrow Wilson School to, be, to, to get the higher degree and then go on to the State Department. She shied away from that, that was a little corrupt for her. And um, I followed her over the years. Um, she stopped talking to me after a while, but she did all the right things, the politically correct things, acknowledged the, that, that we were living on Native American land, um, put pronouns up on her um, social media. And I found out after not hearing from, from her or about her for many decades that she died. She died. Um, homeless and in the street um, on the day before the 4th of July. It, it, it seemed such, a, I mean, I'm doing this fear talk with you today, but three days ago, someone whose life may have been, may have been contorted because she, she feared simply asserting herself enough um, because she was so radical and so pure, she just could not do it. It 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 pulls at my heartstrings personally, of course, because you wonder. This was thirty five years ago. You wonder if I could have done something to have to have helped her. 
uh, negotiate the world. And of course I didn't, because this is how she ended up. Okay. She was very popular. She always had lots of friends. But I, I'm sorry to be going on and on like this in the midst of the fear talk, but it, it's hard for me to get out of my mind. My book speaks to people like that. It, it attempts to speak to people like that, yeah. to say you cannot only care about others. You cannot, if you want to change a world that's corrupt and evil, you cannot yourself be completely free of the corruption and evilness if yeah. you want to do good. If you want to reach Americans, you have to kind of live like Americans do. Otherwise, they will not hear you. And this is one of the morals of my book. Right. My book, the current book. Why don't you I hold, should, it up, should... hold it up, Mark? Yeah. Yeah, I, I happen to have one right by my side. 2023. Here you go. Yeah. Up just... from social. Yeah, just last month. Up from socialism. Just Here's pull it, just pull it back a bit. Young man. Yeah, just pull it back a bit. <laughs> you, can, you, you. can you see? Yeah, if you can pull you it back. see the sky? And down a bit. I, yeah, perfect. Okay, up from socialism. This is not an attack on socialism. I'm okay. just trying to get Americans to, to or radicals to move beyond um, socialism and come up with their own political point of view already. Not a rejection of socialism, but an incorporation and in going beyond. Yeah. But this picture, of course, <clears throat> I was too modest to choose such a picture. This was my publisher's doing. I had uh, much more collective pictures of me, me engaged in conversation with others mm -hmm. and me working with others. But but he, bless his, bless his soul. Um, oh, I should mention that he is um, the son of a, of a author whom I loved, um, Saul Bellow. I read many Saul Bellow novels growing up. And though I did not understand them as a young man, his writing was marvelous. And I happened to end up with a publisher where my editor was his son. It was a delightful experience. So even though the publisher is um, a little conservative and one of my current fears, I must tell you, is people will see that this is a conservative publisher and not want to open the book um still i uh i gritted my teeth and went with him because um i so wanted to work with adam bellow and i it was it was delightful um some of the people in the firm the proofreader the copy editor were were um ideologically so conservative that they did not like some of the ways I expressed myself. I expressed myself with absolute honesty. There's a bit of sex in there. There's a bit of uh, drama. There's a lot of confessional. And the writing is the writing of an intense activist. This is not what Bombardier Books is used to. They're used to fairly academic, very um, calm and collected writing. Mine is not that. And it was a fascinating exercise in doing just what I say people should do in my book. Um, I say we should try to communicate with people who are not like us mm -hmm. as much as possible. And even though it's difficult, in the end, if we do that, it's the only way we'll be able to come with the solutions that are truly radical. That is solutions that take all of our wisdom and put it together. Anyway, all of our wisdom went into this book. Uh, they bent toward me a bit, and I bent toward them a book. Nice. Uh, a bit. And the book is now, um, I think, readable, both for them and, and for me. Nice, nice. So there. Yeah, so people who are listening today and maybe not know you too well, I will put all mm -hmm. kinds of links to your work, to your books below in my video on the YouTube. So I'm not mm. going to do a big bio of you so much. Uh -huh. Let's just can ha have more of the conversation. And you've been yes, definitely please. named, and you I think you named yourself, somewhat along the line of a visionary activism. You're interested in a visionary act activism, 
we could call this a transformational politics. You named it different things at different times in your career. I yes. see neo pacifism, new age, yeah. radical yeah. centrism. It's very old. Yes. All, all those different yeah. terms, right? Over right. the years. But visionary activism, um, why would why does that appeal to you? Because I realized early on that the old political points of view were not so relevant in the world I was entering. Um, I, I grew up in Texas and was sent to segregated public school. That is um, white, whites only public school. And it seemed so wrong to me. There just seemed to be such a loss that as soon as my parents sent me away to college, I dropped out and went down to Mississippi to work for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the most militant activist group working in the South at the time to try to integrate the community. But within a few weeks, I realized that this was not what I thought it would be. Rather than trying to integrate the public schools and the, and the uh, public accommodations and all of that, these folks were marching to a different drummer. They were affected by um, black nationalism and by socialism. And rather than listening to the people in their community who wanted no more than just to break down the black white barrier, this SNCC group felt that that was the job of the NAACP or what they used to call contemptuously the NAA. And they were going to introduce black nationalism into Holly Springs, Mississippi. This seemed pointless to me. I, after all, had grown up in a segregated community myself. I saw that this, this, if they wanted to go on and do this 20 or 30 years hence, that would be wonderful. But what we really needed to do now was integrate the place. And so I ended up arguing with them at great length. I wanted to go into the schools. They thought, of course, to be honest, to be to be honest and, and to be fair to them, they thought I would be torn limb from limb. But I had been in a segregated school myself, and I knew how to talk to those kinds of people. They would not let me. And this helped to make me understand that this socialism and this black nationalism and this kind of way that the, the new left was becoming was was no longer any more right for, for us than liberalism or conservatism was. This, this was reinforced again mm -hmm. when I went back to college and joined an SDS group, Students for a Democratic Society. Right. It was the same way there. Everyone my age and younger wanted to develop a new way of thinking for the incredibly prosperous America that was emerging. But these guys and gals, the people that were running SDS, were not interested in listening to the ideas of their younger brothers and sisters. They wanted to teach us Marxism. They wanted to teach us Marxist theory and Marxist practice. So I ended up taking over that SDS group. And uh, uh, for, one, for one happy semester, we uh, <clears throat> we were uh, we were able to to bring in the ideas of people like Jane Jacobs and Carl Rogers right. and the, the very early New Age stuff. Yeah. But uh, but the, anyway, to move on, this kept happening throughout my life. Right on. In the seventies, yeah. when I wrote New Age Politics, the book you brought up, I wrote it because all of the radicals in Vancouver. I wrote it in Vancouver, Canada. Yeah were not interested in it. I was having to bring to them this wonderful stuff, the Hazel Henderson stuff, the right. Marilyn Ferguson stuff. Um, she, she hadn't written her book, of course, but she was all over the World Future Society, the Association for Humanistic Psychology, which I believe you were a part of at one time. Were you not? I just yes. wrote an article for them. It's 1997. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so 
I New Age politics was written basically for my radical friends, telling them, look, we put together the all these ideas that are coming up in appropriate technology, spirituality, ecology, all this stuff which is outside the Marxist worldview at the time. Yeah. If we put all that together, we can come up with a new ideology, one that's right for our time. Anyway, this is what you were calling by all those names, and that I was calling by all those names, depending yeah. on what seemed right at the time. Essentially, it's the same thing that I'm calling transpartisanship or um, radical centrism today, but with one huge difference. Here's the difference. Marilyn and Fritz F. Capra and Charlene Spretnak and Hazel and... Uh, um, <clears throat> all, all these people, we all had wonderful ideas and we wanted to lay them on the American people, but our process was wrong. We did not know how to communicate these ideas. And this is why I wrote the book that I showed you with that wonderful androgynous person on the cover that's just come out. This book is not an intellectual book. I, I talk about 40 books and the, these ideas and the books, in it, but it's not a book of ideas. It's not a book where I say, these are the ideas we need right. to adopt. The you listen to me right. and my cohorts. It's totally an experiential book. It's a book about why, why with all of our good ideas, we were not able to connect with the American people. We were not even able to connect with the political left let alone with the North American mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, voters. And I came up with a number of reasons. The, the book isn't simplistic. Okay. But the primary reason, since you asked, is that we did not know how to listen to other people. We were so arrogant and, as I pointed out, so self-sacrificing that we did not come across as people you could talk to easily. And we did not come across, and this was true, as people who were willing to listen and take seriously other people's fears, needs, or wisdom. Everyone has wisdom, Michael. This is what I learned after 60 years. Everyone has wisdom. The far right has wisdom. The far left has wisdom. Um, even the mushy middle has wisdom. Mm -hmm. And many people who don't fit into those categories have have magnificent wisdoms that, that we need to listen to if we want to create a, a truly radical and truly life-giving society. So this is what all of my experiences came to after 350 pages in the book. And I have to tell you, Michael, it's very difficult for people to read because in the book, I'm phenomenally honest, if I must say so myself, not only about my own faults and failings, not yeah. that I beat myself. I just speak honestly about when I would live with a woman, for instance, because what I wanted I was to learn from her, not because I loved her, right. that sort of thing. I was also honest, uh, preternaturally so, about other people, about my relationship with my parents, about um, women, about extensively about my colleagues and how we fought with one another. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I was, or tried to be honest about everyone. And as a result, it's very, very difficult for people to read who, especially those who knew me. And I'm already getting letters from people saying things like, well, you talked a little bit about how angry you were toward me, but here's three incidents that you didn't mention. I got that letter the other day and I wrote an apology, of course. I said the letter wasn't really about us, um, but... Anyway, it's too late to apologize. I said, and then I said something like, but I want you to understand, but I want you to know that I understand how much was lost. And that, I mean, could be said for many of the relationships that us activists had with each other 
and for the missed opportunities we had when we created our groups, the New World Alliance, for instance, yeah. which was a green group in the United States five years before the Greens set foot here. But we weren't able to pull it together for reasons that I explain ad nauseum in the book. And I have quotes from us and dialogues of us and dialogue with each other, showing how time and again, we hurt one another. I don't go on and on about how we hurt one another. I just throw, show through dialogue how we did and how this hurtfulness made it impossible for us to translate our ideas into ideas that we could bring easily and successfully to the American people. The thing is heartbreaking. I spent many tears yeah, for sure. over the last six years. Yeah. Um, I guess that's what I'm picking up, you know, it's it's so good listening to you because I, mm -hmm. for many reasons, feel a mirror image of a lot of what you're saying, although I wasn't on those front lines like you were up here. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't been my path to do so, but I was always following those movements. I was trying to do what I think you do is synthesize, synthesize, stand back. Yes. Look yes. at the more integration of the different polarities of the just multiple perspectives, and yet still keep still keep this liberational emancipatory interest, and then mm -hmm. everything is not equal, but everything has something to teach. So I yes. am very much of that ilk. My work, when I you see it and read it about fear, particularly, I do a transdisciplinary approach. I am not interested in one discipline, one ideology, determining what fear means and how we should manage fear. So I yes, have a yes. similar perspective to you. And, and then, of course, you get into such a mess because of the people who are totally committed to the neurobiology and psychology of fear they do not want to hear about the philosophy of fear, the theology of fear, you know, the sociologists. The sociologists don't want to hear from the psychologists. Of, of course, of course. And all of a sudden you're into whether it's you, right, in all these groups, these activist groups, or whether it's the disciplines of knowledge and knowing in the academy or even in popular culture. Those do not want to do a lot of listening to each other. So I am very much on track with you. And I want to say is that. Yes, I, I'm not surprised, Michael. I know your yeah. work well enough to know yeah. that. And the you, fact you we're here you talking. You fight everything I say. Yes. Yeah. The fact we're here talking together, I think, tells we have this sensibility to this. Inter I call it a critical integral perspective. Mm -hmm. And for different mm -hmm. reasons I use that. I mean, Ken Wilber's work as a model of philosophy, a critical integral philosophy interested me long time ago in the early 80s. And I said, okay, now that's respecting all of the differences, the levels, the perspectives, the historical right. context of knowledge. And yet what I learned too is that why the intolerance to that other if we want to call it, right, the difference, the other, whether that's a strong political ideology per se, or it's an epistemological, you know, um, digging in to a particular way of knowing, yeah. right? What I learned is that yes, I yes. will turn use some terms, there's a, a lack or of development. It's not people's fault per se. I find it's bred into this education, and I'm speaking mainly about the West. That's where I grew up, so I'm going to just speak about us here in the West. And, of course, lots of diversity in that West, but there's still an education, public education system. I'm a professional educator. I study this stuff. Is that there's a lack of existential capacity. And, again, no one's fault. It's like bred into us to not be okay with not knowing everything. And so you talk about that righteousness, right? That can come into a really good movement, but it's mm -hmm. so filled with the righteousness of we've got it, you need to get it. And all of a sudden the possibilities of a real transformational mu co-mutual change, a grounded in good listening exactly. and yes. compassion. So I call it an existential incapacity. And then that I link to, because we have been taught to handle fear, our fear experiencing in a way that keeps telling us it's a threat. It's a threat. It's a threat. There's another threat because it's different. And that is a really well, sure, we education. 
Yeah, yeah. We 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 get into our different silos because of well, in, in my book, it's anger, but it could just as easily be called fear. I in agree. fact, I I didn't prepare much for this yeah. show, as you told me not to. But one thing I did do was do a word search in my book, okay. and I saw that there were twenty five references to fear or or similar words such as scared. Yeah. Um. It came up so often. Cool. And one thing you might be interested in, you mentioned Wilbur. I did, when I was writing a book, I used um, the chart that Ken Wilbur used. It, it was actually the version that uh, Don Beck did. Oh, yeah. Um, where you may recall, he has colors for the different stages. Yeah. And uh, you go you go from uh, you go from the bottom, bottom angry stage to the uh, to the orange um <clears throat> a stage of uh, of of trying to achieve in the society mm -hmm. to the green stage where you're more holistic to the stage of pure wisdom and then spiritual stage i i use those colors in the book did people you? who love those stages i didn't know you did or may notice that, that those stages are in there okay yeah i had it in the acknowledgments but I took it out at the last minute. Oh, did which you? Which is okay. kind of interesting. Yeah. Because I experienced fear. I took. I didn't take the colors out. Okay. You can see that um, the people who I felt were most spiritual had a turquoise scarf or wore turquoise mittens. Okay. I mean, it's in there. Turquoise is the the yeah, highest yeah. of of Don Beck stages. Sure. And this is of course the spiritual stage. But I took. I took the description of those stages out of my acknowledgments, both because I feared that it would turn people off. Yeah. Um, right. People who were familiar <laughs> with spiritual humanistic thinking. Mm -hmm. And um, because I, I, at some level, I didn't buy it because I felt there was some kind of arrogance in that chart. Yeah. For example, I'm not convinced and I think this is true with Wilbur too. He's not convinced that all the expressions of green are truly holistic. Some of them are what uh, are what he calls false green. And a lot of the green that I describe in my book is false green. And I just didn't want to go through a long explanation yeah, exactly. in the acknowledgments yeah. to how people should not take all of these colors altogether seriously. Oh, yeah. So I wrote the chart. But it's kind of fun. I think people listening to your program will enjoy knowing yeah. that if they look for comments in my book, they will find Don Beck slash Ken Wilbers slash um, colors in there. Yeah. Well, there's a true a visionary healing, you know, politics that you had. I, I was just taking a quote from one of your book reviews and you're basically it says, and I think it's paraphrasing you, if we were willing, you're talking about, let's just say the activist community at large, if we were willing yeah. to address all the behavioral, intellectual, and attitudinal issues, we would have done a lot better. And you basically, I think, said it was because we have this quick, easy attachment to political ideologies that overtake our common interest in a common humanity and exactly that's very holistic right behavioral intellectual attitude and i'm sure you could have put emotional there uh, for yeah, yeah I, i'm sure i do some some other parts in the book yeah. the, the green the green organization which eventually turned into the, the u.s green party okay started out with that point of view okay um, i didn't know that ex, it was extraordinary in the very early days I mean, their slogan. One of their one of our slogans was, um, "Neither left nor right, but in front." And the idea was to to listen hmm. to everyone in our in our uh, um, ten ten uh, key values. Uh, the statement of which I I helped to write. We okay. not only had the ecology and the spirituality, we had such things as. Um, um, <clears throat> fiscal responsibility, something that only the political right was talking about at that time, and unfortunately at this time. Mm -hmm. um, we were willing to do this, but because of our own fear of being rejected by um, the political left, we did not pursue that, and ultimately we fell prey 
to the far left, and as you may know, the U.S. Green Party, unlike the German Green Party, by the way, the U.S. Green Party is now totally a creature of the far left. It's okay. also phenomenally incompetent, okay. which I find <laughs> not not disconnected to the to the presence of the far far left. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, even I, I see the eight... refused to run under that under that banner. I think as soon as he saw how how pathetic their uh, <laughs> their their um, strategists were, um, he left to run his own independent campaign. Okay. Anyway, um, not to. I have your other book here, yes. of course, which um, came out, New Age Politics. Yes. Um, yeah, this is That's the update. A little bit different title. This is 40-year anniversary edition. I just want yes. to our viewers, Mark Satin again, our only real alternative. Yes. That's what you're trying to go to. And in the back of there, there's a section I was just picking up, eight principles of solidarity that were part of the Occupy 2011 movement. And yeah. No doubt you were part of that or interested in it in various really ways. interested in it. Yeah. Those, yeah, those principles. But you'll see also very close to that is a couple of principles from the Tea Party. Oh, is there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's principles from, I think, eight or nine groups okay. that, I, that I listed side by side. Right, and right. of course, the point is we have to take them all seriously nice. because these are these are engaged Americans, caring Americans who think deeply about our problems. Yep. And they're not off base. They just see our problems and our possibilities mm -hmm. from different points of view. Number um, seven on those eight principles, by the way, is the belief that education is a human right. And I circled yeah. that and I said to myself, well, that's interesting. So I'm um, just a little short story um, as an educator. I was very interested in the organization called, you know, Alternative Education Resource Organization. This is mm -hmm. the big alternative education sort of network of coalitions supporting all the kinds of alternative homeschooling you know, anti-schooling movements and so on. Yeah, I remember it from 40 yeah. years ago. Right. They put out a book right. called Turning Points. Right. 35 Visionaries in Education Tell Their Own Story. It's called Turning mm -hmm. Points. Um, it's published by them. So I, in mm -hmm. 2017, took this book. I looked up all the 35 authors. There's 27 authors in there, you know, promoting. These are the top sort of alternative people. They're getting published in here with a chapter each. And I mm -hmm. sent them a fear questionnaire. Every one of them I could find on email, introduce myself. I said, I'm an educator. I'm doing research. And here's some questions I have about fear that I would ask any educator. I'd love to have your answers. I will you know, put those down and I'll write an article, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I didn't get very good response from many, but I, the seven or eight people, nine people I got, they basically more or less said, and this is, again, out of 27 we're not interested to even answer these questions. Wow. And those who actually did, you know, treated them as if they were really not important. I mean, I can tell right away if somebody yeah. takes it seriously. Yes. I, I wrote back to them and I just said, you know, just honestly, I'm not mad or anything. I just, I'm just surprised that you are not actually interested in these questions when fear is such an important issue in how we pursue education. Well, you see what I was doing is kind of like you. I'm taking the progressive edge. This is mm -hmm. the progressive edge of educators, you know, outside the mainstream. Right. They're not interested in fear in the discussion. Right. Well, they were they were fearful. They, they were, were. They probably suspected a trap. They probably suspected a trap. Was, yeah. Was so far outside, they, they might have felt you were a secret right winger who wanted to right. embarrass them, or um, conversely, they may have feared that your real agenda, which is, I suspect it was, was to pull them out of their boxes. And they didn't want to go there. They didn't. Um, it's extraordinary. This is no matter which political ideology I've been part of or hanging out in. Yeah. Um, you you run into that with yeah. the, the latest one, the radical centrist um, or okay. transpartisan, which is the, mo the most current one. I'm fearful of them because they're a little too establishment for me. And they're fearful of me because my God, at different points in my life, I was a war resistor in Canada. In fact, I helped to start the group in Toronto that was bringing Americans up. And uh, worse than that, I was 
involved with, though um, I can't say I was throwing bombs or anything, I was involved with um, certain weather underground people. Mm -hmm. And this has been written about. And the last thing these people want, they want to go off to do, they, 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 they don't know how to relate these um, radical centrists. They, they put out um, websites galore and they write articles in slick magazines that they're professors, but they are not into organizing. They're not into going off and talking to people and building up groups and uh, working for candidates. It's the most frustrating thing okay. in the world. So I'm fearful of them because they're very establishment, that they're fearful of me because of my past and even <clears throat> present associations. When you want to do political organizing, you talk to people who other people don't feel are nice or respectable. You just do. And if you're not willing to get down down in the mud, or um, however you want to put it, with others, you can't be a successful organizer. So we have all these marvelous ideas coming out now that are transpersonal, I'm sorry, transpartisan yeah. and radical centrist that come from groups like the Breakthrough Institute and mm -hmm. the New America um, organization in Washington, D.C., but they all exist on the level of theory and books and articles. And it's the most frustrating thing in the world. Okay. God knows one of the reasons I wrote my book is so, and I say this in the conclusion, is that so young people would be turned on enough to the ideas that I write about and to the to the to the pain that I write about in the book, that they will take up the cudgels of um this transformational approach and yes. listen to everyone and do the organizing that's necessary to take the ideas out of the realm of theory, writing, and pretty websites. And Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I, I, no, no, no harm intended. Um, very intelligent and insightful podcasts. Yeah, <clears throat> I hear you. I'm going to have you read your quotes in just a second here, uh, um, but let's just do a, a little bit of a circling before we get there. Sure. Um, I guess I want to ask you, okay, so you kind of put the big truthing book out, um, very more subjective than a lot of your other uh, work, which was oh, more, totally which yeah. was more synthesis. This one is a synthesis, but it's like your experience. It's like the inside it, and you're just letting it rip. I think you're probably, you know, also putting out, I may not be accurate on all this, but this is where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm willing to be challenged. Send me your letters, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Don't send your bullets. Just send your letters. <laughs> is that no. what you're at? Is this what you want to do for the next few years is listen to the feedback on this book? Or do you have something else also in mind? Well, I'd, I'd love to spend all my time listening to the feedback, but that, that assumes that I'd have hundreds of thousands of readers. I, I'm not sure I can make make that assumption. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the the book the book is is much more coherent than it, it you think um it's actually very carefully structured um it goes through the new left and the arguments you'll see very carefully show why the new left didn't catch on and why my generation moved away from the new left to try to create its own um political point of view throughout the 70s 80s and 90s now, socialism and the new, new left is being rediscovered today. But <clears throat> I, I write about why in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, through all the groups I go through, uh, why we were not able to succeed in breaking through either to the, to the left or to the larger culture. So even though it looks like a mishmash, um, I, it is pretty coherent in terms of a person can go through there and see, oh, Saturn gives us this reason, this reason, and this reason. Yep. The last part, I show how the trans transpartisan and radical centrist movement has gotten it together on the level of theory, but I explore why we haven't been able to get it uh, together on the level of practice. Yep. That is, um, we don't do organizing. And so even though that's especially painful if you read it 
um, <laughs> if you if you just get involved in the sob story aspect of it. It's also a very um, a, a very careful critique of what we need to do better. And uh, in the end, of course, I critique everyone um, mercilessly, and uh, myself included, by the way, um, and uh, try to explain what the next generations need to get from our experience. Well, so the book is by future. no means a mishmash. That's your future, isn't it, Mark? It's really, <clears throat> I, can I give this to the next generation? Can I pass something on here? That must a lot yeah. of your drive. Yeah, yeah. How how I do it is beyond me. Um, I just hope I don't lose my eyesight before <laughs> before I'm able to do any of it. Um, as, as you know, I walk around Oakland with uh, with dark glasses and a cane. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll just see. We'll just see if my you know. 50 years of activist activist work not caring about my own body um if i can hold on for another five or ten um <laughs> but i don't i don't know what i'll do um yeah. i i it's from from what it sounds like on university campuses the left will hate me and the right will hate me I so don't I, know that. who someone someone may care to bring me in we'll see We'll work on it. Um, could yeah, you could you. you bring your quote that or a couple of quotes you had and let's share those as we go out and okay. I so appreciate you doing this. Well, let me see. Let me see what I can do. Yeah. Let's see if this light. I may need this light. Yeah. Do the so, best you can. Does it uh, ruin the picture no. too much? No, you're fine. Okay, good. So here's my thick glasses and and just this... say why you picked what you picked as well. Well, I, I picked a couple things. Um, we may have we never covered it all. Um, okay. Here, let me see. What would what would be good here? Why don't I read uh, my redefinition of radical politics in America? Lovely. This may this may be a way to go out. Um, this is from the introduction of the new book, and it's uh, it's. It starts out with this letter. I actually wrote the whole book as a letter to social change activists, though of course it's for um, everyone else as well. Here, let me. Ah, okay. This is in 22 point type. This letter is about the origin, evolution, and potential of a new kind of radical politics in America. I wrote it as a memoir using my life as a sort of lens because I was there from the start and wanted to convey the human as well as the political side of our story. As every activist knows, you can't really separate the two. Paragraph, many of us like to call ourselves post-socialist radicals now. We also use terms like radical centrist and transpartisan. It's not that we we're unhappy with socialism being out there I really need to put that in because they, they titled my book up from socialism. <clears throat> it's just that when formulating policies, we draw from diverse other perspectives as well. To us, everyone has a piece of the truth, right populists and left populists, libertarians and greens, biblical Christians and Islamists. <laughs> that, that line is particularly relevant today. <clears throat> Turning Point USA and Black Lives Matter. Three dots, everyone. And, and here, this is the key sentence. <clears throat> this is the real re redefinition. And the more radical you are, the more willing you are, um, not to say I'm right and I'm wrong, I'm extemporizing, but to listen to, respect, and accommodate everyone's most vital interests as distinct from their emotionally expressed of its positions on issues. You see, that's what you were talking about. You get it got below the anger, below the anger to the fear, to the feelings, to the um to the wisdom. And once you do that, on the grand scale a new political ideology will arise. And on a smaller scale, we'll be able to come up with truly constructive um alternatives. To, to problems that seem to be tearing us apart from affirmative action to immigration to whatever. Yep. This is my hope. 
And I demonstrate that in the book to the extent that one person can, though obviously this has got to be a collective, collaborative work <clears throat> of many. Well said. And not just on paper. Yeah, not just on paper. That's why we need organizing. Yep. Okay, so, lovely to talk to you again, Mark. Uh, oh, it's been so much work. fun. Has I, it? I, I'm so, I, I so enjoyed it. And I, I so enjoyed the, the back and forth of it. Excellent. We'll see you next time. We'll get this Thank up you. on YouTube and we'll keep, oh. stay in touch. Same, same. All the best. Good luck to you and your work. Yeah.